Okay, thanks a lot, a lot, Ray. Um, I think we got through a lot of information uh, today. And as I uh, listened to uh, Laura and Ray's uh, uh, presentations, a few things kind of uh, struck me or a little bit of summary wrap up here. Um, first is that as we think about the water quality goals that are out there, either in the Chesapeake and Mississippi River Basin, uh, we're going to need a variety of practices to, to reach those goals. We really are going to need uh, infield management, cropping systems, and uh, I think this emerging area of edge of field practices. Um, these edge of field practices are critical, uh, but I know at least in, in the Midwest, um, there's a real struggle with the cost of these and how are we going to pay for them. And the scale of implementation of these practices is going to need to be very, very large. Um, and so how, we, um, how that's done from a financial standpoint, uh, even a technical standpoint, having the, the people resources to help farmers uh, get these implemented, I think is going to be very, very critical. Um, as we think about differences in, in certain areas, the focus uh, may be on phosphorus in some locations, uh, maybe a little bit more on nitrogen in other locations. I think one of the other things that we need to, to recognize and, and consider is that the sources of the nutrients are, are critical in some areas. Um, that phosphorus loading, there may be a lot of total phosphorus loading that's coming from stream beds and banks and, and factoring that in as well uh, may also uh, be important. It was interesting to, to hear more about um, the Chesapeake Bay and the Chesapeake Bay model and using that to, to uh, um, assess progress. Uh, within the, we're kind of, I'd say a little bit behind in the Midwest in, as we think about Gulf of Mexico hypoxia and, and tracking progress to reducing loading uh, uh, to the Gulf. And so there's uh, many questions around uh, direct water quality monitoring uh, for, for measuring improvements, uh, tracking of practices for implementation or developing tools uh, to predict that progress. And so there are kind of ongoing activities around that and probably something uh, that we need to, uh, to, to consider um, as we move forward. Uh, one of the other things that I think is we think about some of these edge of field practices um, is the importance of citing those practices where they can have the greatest impact uh, and understanding as we start working on watershed projects, maybe the potential for for some of those edge of field practices in that specific watershed. Um, I'm thinking about things like drainage water management, something like that may be best suited for fairly flat fields. And so going into some of our watershed planning, um, being able to quickly assess whether uh, there's a great uh, potential applicability in that watershed or not uh, may be important because uh, you know we do have finite uh, resources both on technical uh, helping the farmer as well as financial to get something implemented. So spending our time with those practices that have the greatest potential to be implemented in that watershed and have the greatest potential for success, I think is critical. And so I think tools like the ACPF, for those that, that aren't familiar, the Ag Conservation Planning Framework that's been developed by uh, Mark Tomer and, and David James, among others at the USDA Agricultural Research Service, uh, National Laboratory for Agriculture and the Environment, I think is a good tool uh, that can be used in some locations and, and probably needs to be uh, developed for other locations, but for, for citing of practices and making some of that, those, um, those first cut analysis. So those are, I guess, are kind of some, some wrap up uh, comments and, and things to hopefully um, expand on the discussion a little bit.